Hello, everyone, and thanks for hanging out with us for the Behind the Numbers Weekly Listen, an e-marketer podcast made possible by M Particle. This is the Friday show that reviews the most newsworthy media and retail news stories of the week. I'm your host, Marcus Johnson, in today's show. Checking in on hybrid work. People will just, you know, have a little bit more leeway, maybe not exactly what they would want, but maybe more than in the before times. Attention-based mobile ads. Attention-based measurement is a really exciting area to watch right now in that respect. And so I think this acquisition makes perfect sense. The circular retail dream. Corporate responsibility is really big in retail right now. And having ways to recycle and sell refurbished items are one of the ways in which these retailers are striving to meet their goals that they've laid out for sustainability. Spotify rebrands Green Room. Predicting the future of grocery, an unpopular opinion about bringing your whole self to work, and an interesting fact about American towns. It's a fact about America. I don't know if it's interesting. We'll see. Joining me for today's episode, we have three people. Let's meet them. We start with one of our analysts, an analyst covering <laughs> digital media, as she, like, as she likes to be called. It's Evelyn Mitchell. Hey, Marcus. I hope this doesn't last forever. <laughs> it will. She's an analyst. That's how she described herself once and shall forevermore be known. Everything uh, lasts also, forever on this show. Was that Paul? Everything lasts forever on this show. Everything yeah. will be held and used against you. Yeah, unfortunately. Excellent. Welcome, Evelyn. Thanks. <laughs> Please stay. Happy please, to be please here. Stay. <laughs> Doesn't feel like it, and that's fair. We're also joined by one of our senior analysts covering retail and e-commerce, and apparently lighting fixtures. What does that even mean? It's Blake Drosh. Good to be here. Hi, Blake. <laughs> We're also joined by our principal analyst who heads up our digital advertising and media practice. It's Paul Vanner. Great to be here. And Blake, I might need some lighting fixtures work Do at my house. Do this on your own time, so, uh, gentlemen. We, just, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll you can, I've got time. a private line. You can. We, we can talk. We can talk after the show. I'm starting a a podcast as well. No need. No one will listen. They probably will. Please don't leave this one and go to that one. Okay, what do we have in store for you today? Well, four segments as per usual. We start with the story of the week, checking in on hybrid work. We then move to the game of the week where our contestants will go head to head to head to try and give us the best takeaway they possibly can from each of the four stories and win a championship belt if they do better than the other two folks. That's how we play the game. We then move to Uncommon Knowledge. Our third segment, we talk about some unpopular opinions and finally dinner party data where we discuss some random trivia. That closes out the show. We start though with the story of the week, checking in on hybrid work. Did the pandemic usher in the future of work or is hybrid work just a temporary arrangement? Asks Jason Ayton of Inc. He notes in a recent piece that Google's hybrid work arrangement has just started. That means most employees are expected to be in the office three days a week, working remotely the rest of the time. But Google's former head of HR, Laszlo Bock, told Bloomberg that hybrid work won't last. Because, number one, people who work more remotely will be disadvantaged when it comes to pay increases and promotions. They'll get overlooked. Number two, there will be a fear of missing out that pulls people back into the office at some point. Number three, bosses want people back in. Box says he thinks it will be no more than three to five years before everyone is back in the office the way things were before COVID-19. Folks, do we agree? I tend to disagree. I think that fully remote work, I don't think will last because it just makes sense that companies do want people back. But the whole idea of hybrid, if I understand how that's defined, is that you basically get to pick and choose certain days and that you have more flexibility and that all of the tools that we've been using 24-7, you can use maybe not 24-7, but occasionally and strategically. And that seems to me like something that will continue, mm. where people will just, you know, have a little bit more leeway, maybe not exactly what they would want, but maybe more than in the before times. Well, that's the big question is, what do people mean by hybrid? Because Apple, they're asking employees to come once a week. That's First, saying employees need to come at least once a week. By late May, they're requiring them to come in on set days, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, according to the New York Times. And and this was one of the points made in the Economist article is how to make hybrid work a success. You need to look at what the shape of the hybrid week is. 
you need to choose the days that people should come in and be clear about when you want people to be in the office. Because if you let people just come in two days, you have to come in three days, you could all miss each other. Like I could come in Monday and Friday and Paul could come in the other days of the week. And what's the point of having come in because we've both missed each other. Any other thoughts? Yeah, there are a lot of logistics for sure, but I can also envision people being more responsive to events in their lives and whether it's a doctor's appointment or whether it's about weather. I mean, the New York subway gets flooded every time it rains now. So if you have already had the experience of working remotely and you know you can be more productive on a day when it just happens to be torrentially raining, then what employer would want to enforce that against you and say, no, you can't, you have to come into the office. So that's kind of what I mean about more flexibility. But yeah, I think we've even experienced it ourselves within our ranks where we have certain people coming in at certain times, but there's no consensus as to when it might be. And each time you come in, you check in with everyone else to see who's going to be in, to see if mm -hmm. it's even worthwhile coming in. Because right. if you're just going to be the only person in your department or team working in the office, then maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense. And so I just pulled up the sheet that shows us who's coming in on which days. So Joni Lewis sent me this. She does everything. She's fantastic. Shout out to Joni. She sent me this sheet showing which people came in which days. And there's some days where there's two people. There's some days where there's eight people. Most, I think maybe 20 odd. Um, looking at March, going back to February. February, yeah, it was a handful. March, there's a couple more. Maybe it gets up to 10 some days or 15. But that's 10 or 15 people out of 350. Now, yes, not all of them are based in the New York area, so they all can't come into the office, but that's still a fraction of people who were obviously in beforehand. Evelyn, I want to come to you. I mean, a lot of us are working remotely and the idea of being hybrid, being made to come in a few days a week may sound quite jarring, but at the same time, if the company says, hey, if you want to work for this company, you've got to come in for these days, is it going to be a mass exodus? Are people really going to leave their jobs if they have to come back in? Because we're in a remote working world, at least for our company. We've not yet moved into a full hybrid one in the sense of people really spending a good amount of time in the office that's kind of equitable to being remote. I think just from my perspective, so I started at II about five months ago now. And so I started during the pandemic and I have not been into the office, partially because I'm not gonna know my way around, right? It would be a lot more pleasant of an experience to have someone there to show me around and like, you know, someone to tell me where to sit, where the bathroom is, where to find coffee, that stuff. Cause I can imagine going in on my own for the first time would be just catastrophe after catastrophe, but <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of very nice people in the office when I do go in for the first time. But I don't think it's a coincidence that the great resignation is happening right now and has been happening as these kind of hybrid work environments have entered a period of exploration. Because like Paul mentioned, people have gotten a taste of what this flexibility is like, the kinds of opportunities it affords in terms of taking charge of the kinds of events you can attend. Like I've heard parents being able to attend you know, some events at their children's school that they wouldn't otherwise be able to see and the kinds of joy that that can bring just by not having to be required to go into an office every single day. Those are important moments. And we are also having a broad conversation now about burnout and how to make sure that we can achieve a work-life balance as we collectively deal with this traumatic experience that our society is having. So I don't think that we will go back to the way things were fully. I think you know, employers should consider the hybrid work environment as an opportunity to differentiate themselves among other competitors where their employees could potentially go. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's ways to better spend the time an hour commuting, driving train, however you get in versus spending half an hour of that hour taking your kids to school, which you only get to do whilst they're at school, they're only young once, and then maybe another half an hour going for a run or something. It's hard to argue that going on the commute is worthwhile. And there's not a better way of spending that time. But it does seem that there are a lot of companies that do want folks to come back in, not just these big tech companies, but some other ones as well. Blake, where do you land? I agree with Evelyn that the job market is still really hot right now. And this is going to become the offer for employees to work hybrid or remotely. Is That's going to become a competitive advantage for companies that are willing to offer that flexibility. You hear about Google and Apple and a lot of the big banks and yeah, I think they are such, you know, these preeminent companies that they maybe have a little bit more sway because I don't think the 
you know, number of people and applications that these companies get are going to dry up no matter, you know, mm-hmm. what their in office or hybrid practices end up being. But for yeah. a lot of other companies out there that are struggling to find talent right now because the job market is so hot, I don't know if it would be in their best interest to adopt a stringent policy one way or another where offering flexibility could be seen as a huge advantage to a lot of potential employees who want to decide what works best for them based on their own personal schedule. There's some research from Nicholas Bloom, Stanford University, suggesting that on average employees reckon the blend of in-person and remote work um, let's call it hybrid, is a perk equivalent to an 8% pay increase. So people are willing to give up 8% of the increase for the sake of, of keeping their hybrid ability. But we've kind of rushed into this because of a pandemic. No one's really sat down and thought through how could this work best. Same with kids having to go to school on their laptops versus in person. It was kind of all done in a rush. No one sat down and thought, what's the best way to, to do this? And I think that companies should take a second to really think that through and have a full audit of this process and not just be like, well, we're doing things this way now, let's just keep doing them, but to really kind of have a hard reset in terms of what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. But also it may seem like it makes sense in the moment, but you may be giving up something else in in the future. And by that, I'm making the point of people who work remotely being disadvantaged when it comes to pay increases or promotions, or maybe just being involved in interesting projects. There is something to be said for being remote and how you're viewed. Few stats here, 92% of execs at medium to large firms think workers who turn their cameras off during meetings don't have long-term futures at the company. There was a new survey from software company Viopta, Um, Erica Pandey of Axios noted that. And the same share, 93% of executives think people who frequently turn off their cameras probably aren't paying attention. So there could be consequences if you're just remote. Some people have always been remote and don't have a choice. So there shouldn't be the case that there is bias against people who are remote versus in person, but that may be the way things shake out. But hybrids, yeah, hybrid works here to stay. The Economist notes the job is now to make sure that hybridization works as well as it can for both employees and employers. From The Economist, that depends on one ingredient above all they know, which is clarity. Things function best when everyone knows what is expected. That's what we've got time for for the story of the week. It's time now for the game of the week. First quick word from our sponsor, Particle. At the end of the day, your customer has to be at the center of everything you do. This starts with the right customer data strategy as well as the right foundation to solve the challenges that typically inhibit success such as data quality, data governance, and connectivity. MParticle is your real-time customer data infrastructure that helps you accelerate your data strategy by cleansing, visualizing, and integrating your customer data from anywhere to anywhere. Ultimately, better data leads to better decisions, better customer experiences, and better outcomes. See why the best brands choose MParticle. Go to www.mparticle.com. Folks, we are back. It's time now for the game of the week. Today's game, what's the point? Where I read out four stories and have contestants, Evelyn, Paul, and Blake, tell us what they think is the main takeaway of the story. Okay answers get one point, good answers get two, and answers that give you the same feeling as unfathomably soft blankets. Answers that leave you with that feeling, they get you three points. Each person gets 20 seconds to answer before they hear this. Whoever has most points wins gets the last word. We start with... We start with Evelyn, top of the screen. Attention-based mobile ads. Cargo acquires Parsex technology to build an attention-based post-cookie alternative for mobile advertising, writes briefing director Jeremy Goldman. He explains that mobile ad exchange Cargo has bought attention sales platform Parsec Media to build an offering that lets advertisers buy ads based on seconds of on-screen exposure per ad exchanger. Once an ad is served, Parsec measures how long it stayed on screen, and the machine learning then looks at the time of day, ad creative, presence of cookies, etc., to optimize ad placements over time, Jeremy notes. But attention-based mobile ads, Evelyn, what's the point? 
So I think ad measurement is experiencing an upheaval right now with third party identifiers going away. And as stressful as it is, it's also an opportunity to reevaluate what was the status quo and try out some alternatives that solve for longstanding pain points and replace some question marks with some metrics. Attention based measurement is a really exciting area to watch right now in that respect. And so I think this acquisition makes perfect sense. Blake. Yeah, I mean, without being you know an expert on the topic, it seems like this is something that would be a really good selling point to an advertiser who is constantly wondering if money is being wasted on ads that are being displayed without eyeballs on them. And this is sort of a really rudimentary way of ensuring that and providing that value to the advertiser. Paul? Yeah, I understand the need to buy ads based on a different metric or because legacy identifiers are going away, so advertisers are looking for different ways to quantify their ad spend. But I want to zero in on Parsec's definition of this ad format as, quote unquote, politely interruptive. And that reminds me of how outstream ads were characterized when they first came along. And to me, outstream are not politely interruptive, but just simply interruptive and continue to be. And no one has fixed that. So I'm a little skeptical about this. We move to our second round. We start with Blake, the circular retail dream. IKEA is making its buy back and resell service permanent in the US as part of its goal to become a circular business by 2030, per CNN, writes Insider Intelligence retail analyst Rachel Wolf. She notes that IKEA loyalty members can sell their gently used furniture back to the retailer for store credit. Customers fill out a form online, get a quote for the item's value, Bring the item in for an employee assessment. Is it clean? Is it unmodified? Is it completely assembled? If it passes, the furniture will be sold in an as-is section at reduced prices. Some items, like sofas, don't qualify. Blake, the circular retail dream, what's the point? You know, I think it's a good idea. Corporate responsibility is really big in retail right now. And having ways to recycle and sell refurbished items are one of the ways in which uh, these retailers are striving to meet their goals that they've laid out for sustainability. But specifically on this note, I think most people who have owned IKEA furniture know that it's really hard to survive one move when you have already (laughs) assembled (laughs) <laughs> and I don't know if that bar is like super high for the, you know, the current state of whatever you're attempting to turn in. Like if that's too high, then I don't think any piece of Ikea furniture once removed from the home and transported to the retailer is going to meet that quality because most of this stuff like is great for one time use. But as soon as you try to move it, it just falls apart. And that's always been my experience with Ikea. So it's interesting that they're taking this route. You're not wrong. You're very right. But it's technical foul for going long on the answer. Had to do it, Paul. (laughs) Mildly used is sort of like politely interruptive, Um, (laughs) but I give Ikea or any company credit for trying to be more sustainable, but the stipulation that the furniture must be completely assembled in order to pass muster for this program is a complete deal breaker because most Ikea furniture can't be assembled in the first place. (laughs) (laughs) It's impossible. (laughs) We move to our third round. We start with Paul, Spotify. Hey, hey, hey. ho, ho, ho. Hold on a second. Oh, (laughs) Evelyn. How dare you, Marcus? <laughs> I'm sorry. I got distracted. With... I was already. I'm like, I know. I'm let's sorry. <laughs> Evelyn, it's your turn. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. This happens every now and again. I do it with Rahul quite a bit. Sorry, Evelyn. You're up. <laughs> okay. So my first thought on this piece was of me trying to lug a fully assembled piece of furniture to Ikea on the subway. If that ends up as a bit in How I Met Your Father in season two, would be unsurprised and I will come for Hulu for that idea. (laughs) I think this service has marginally more potential in driving cities, but the other serious limitations like on what kinds of furniture will be accepted and that quality piece. Ultimately, I think this service relies too much on the consumers who already have other avenues of reselling furniture like Facebook Marketplace if they want to go that route, so. Round three, we start with Paul. Spotify rebrands Green Room. Spotify's live audio app Green Room, which came out last summer, will be rebranded as Spotify Live and placed in its main app per Bloomberg, I think. 
Sarah Perez of TechCrunch notes that Spotify Live will continue to work as Green Room did by allowing creators to interact with their audience in real time and serve as a creation mechanism for hosts. Paul, Spotify rebrands Green Room. Well, I didn't specifically predict this, but I did see it coming. And we've talked in the podcast before about the meteoric rise and the seemingly equally meteoric fall of Clubhouse as a standalone business. But we've also talked about the staying power of these live audio features within larger platforms offering. So Twitter and Amazon have already essentially featureized their live audio services. Spotify now doing it is basically the third one that makes a trend. Evelyn. I think if any company wants social audio to remain in play in some capacity, it's imperative to remove any friction in user experience and make it easier for users to stumble upon and engage with the functionality kind of just in their native app experience. So this makes sense to me. And I also wonder why it took so long for Spotify to rebrand Greenroom because Spotify has a really strong brand. So lending their name to any of its like sub platforms or products could provide a boost in cachet that potentially is sorely needed. We move to our final round. Predicting. Oh, oh. wow. This guy's skipping people left Wait, and right miss? today. Oh, Do Blake. you have somewhere to be at for this, Marcus? <laughs> Are you trying to cut everyone out? <laughs> At first, I thought it was maybe part of like an initiation right for Evelyn, but obviously this is a, a much larger pattern I'm that a, I agree I'm is, having a wonderful is, day. is a technical this foul is, for sure. This is sure. how you're going to treat a veteran <laughs> of the weekly listen. I'm so sorry. Blake, please tell the people. Um, well, I think that Spotify is actually what they're doing here, too, is trying to transition this feature from social audio, which, uh, you know, kind of had this colossal if failing moment after its initial burst to a format for live podcasts, which I think are very similar, but also very different because if you have a really popular podcaster that is going to leverage this, it's going to get a lot more attraction than just, you know, these smaller niche rooms, which was sort of more of what social audio grew up on. So I think having that feature more closely associated with popular podcasts on Spotify could help bring its audience over there as well. We move to our final round. We start with Evelyn predicting the future of grocery. We can't predict the grocery future, writes Shira Overday of the New York Times. She notes that Americans are definitely buying far more groceries online than we were in 2019. But in some notable categories, such as fresh and frozen foods, the growth of online sales is much lower than pre-pandemic. And in recent months, online grocery sales have dropped or barely budged from the prior year. Grocery delivery is still very low. Grocery click and collect is much higher. Evelyn, predicting the future of grocery, what's the point? So just on the point of the fresh and frozen produce situation, I think, I mean, buying produce without being able to look at it or touch it is not super appealing to me, especially in the city. It, there's some significant risk there. But I think the biggest takeaway of this article is that it's been two steps forward, one step back coming out of the pandemic. And that makes it really challenging to nail down firm consumer behavior trends that we're totally confident won't be undone the next time we take a step forward or step back. So I think it's important to just remain flexible, especially at this point in time, you know, with people experimenting with hybrid working situations and just new routines. Yeah. On that point, maybe this is happening, but I do feel as though, I don't know if bifurcation is the right word, but this kind of separation of grocery categories into fresh produce and then just canned goods and things in boxes. I wonder if grocery stores are going to really start to separate them out more and more because yes, you have a fresh fruit and veg section over here, but they, they are things that people just will always want to go into. So making that experience much better, uh, more of a kind of like local market, neighborhood market experience. And then all the other stuff that people are happy to just click uh, rebuy, uh, whether that's milk or cereal or bread or whatever. Um, instant coffee. And, instant coffee. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> which lots of people do, by the way. Okay. I don't think they don't. It's just me. I wonder if we are going to see grocery stores actually recognize that difference between the shopper's experience and what they actually want to buy online versus not a little bit more. But Blake, you're up. So, yeah, I mean, this article brings up a good point. And, you know, our forecast numbers for food and beverage, we're expecting that this year only 6.4% of U.S. food and beverage sales will come from online. But you also have to really look at that, you know, and the, and the article does bring up this point, but it's it's really important to look at the fact that 
it's a $1.2 trillion business, food and beverage retail sales. So that percentage, even if it just gets to like 10%, you're looking at like tons and tons of money that is being generated through e-commerce. And that's why food and beverage retailers and all the other players in the space are focusing so much on e-commerce is that the needle doesn't have to move that far percentage wise in order for a lot and a lot of money to to come into e-commerce. Paul, I find it interesting that this New York Times article about online groceries singled out bananas because in my <laughs> opinion, among all fruits, bananas are the ones whose ripeness point is the most specific and critical. So in other words, that sweet spot when a banana is perfectly ripe to eat lasts less than any other fruit. So it's probably the fruit that most lends itself to being bought in person rather than online. And to Evelyn's point, I think that for perishable groceries, definitely a very different approach than for other groceries. On that point though, Paul, just learned the other day that there's a banana vending machine in Tokyo. Paul, that would never avocados? fly with me. I was about to say avocados, yeah. man, avocados. <laughs> I do, and I agree that they also have that very specific ripeness point. And it's like to, a half an hour. Know, <laughs> it is, yeah. And and actually it's funny you bring that up because we were talking before about, you know, remote work, hybrid work, and office work. So our office is famous for, among other things, baskets of avocados, but like, you know, the number of people who can actually take advantage of that is minimal because 75 avocados, like one of them will be ripe at just the right point. And, you know, whoever gets that one avocado in that moment is lucky and the rest just go to waste. They're so fickle. Yes. Anyway, that's all we've got time for for the game of the week. This week's winner is Blake. Congratulations to Blake. He wins strong numbers at the end there. Congratulations to Blake. He wins the game of the week. Gets the last word. Blake? I got to say, I, I do not expect to win these because there's such a strong bias against me. You say that every time, Blake. You that say that every time you win. You win all the time, yeah, and you always bias. act like you're not prepared because no you, in this guy. you didn't think you were going to win. But I guess I'm just going to plug my report that I'm working on because my report's all about subscription e-commerce, and it talks exactly... Do you want to talk about, you don't want to talk about the Dodgers? You don't want my to talk next about the report Dodgers? is about subscription oh, e-commerce, no. and it talks about exactly <laughs> game. Uh, what Marcus was That's alluding true. to, which is that there are a lot of retailers and other D2Cs that are focusing on giving a lot of CPG and other grocery goods that aren't like fresh fruit and meat and poultry. They're really leaning into that subscription model because as people start start and continue to buy more digital grocery and essential goods online, there is a really big need for the convenience of the subscription model for like things like Amazon subscribe and save, which not only delivers people things like dry foods, paper towel, toilet paper, toothpaste on a reoccurring basis, but they also save a little bit of money. So it's also very enticing for those digital grocery shoppers that are starting to spend more of their budgets online and are worried about the costs of inflation and all that stuff. Congratulations to Blake. He won the game of the week. We made terrible points at the end. Why, why would you not congratulate the, the Dodgers? Why would you not do that? Such a shame. It's just like digital grocery, man. It's too early to tell if they're going to be successful <laughs> or not. Eight and two in their first 10 games. It's not bad. Not bad start. Went to my first Cubs game. Cool. Last night. It was fantastic. It was so cold. It was the worst thing in the world. Everyone there was so nice. Became best friends with everyone who worked there. And it's fantastic ballpark. Anyway, let's move on. It's time now for Uncommon Knowledge. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge, the segment where we offer up some unpopular or atypical opinions about things. We start with an unpopular opinion from the BBC Radio 1 feature. This was inspired by... We then have an unpopular opinion from the internet. And finally, we get an unpopular opinion from one of our analysts related to the media world. We start with an unpopular opinion from the radio, uh, BBC Radio 1. You can overcomplicate pizza. Can you? Yes, for sure. Oh, okay. Maybe this is, is it po Blake? Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. That was a popular opinion. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm on board. It happened to me the other day. Oh, never mind. Okay. Maybe rephrase this. You can't. <laughs> Totally disagree. It happened to me the other day. It got by. I ordered a pizza that was overcomplicated and it was a bad experience. What do we have? I ordered like a, a pizza that had 
I think Italian fennel, like a fennel spice sausage. And I envisioned like a flatbread with, you know, a couple of nice slices of sausage sprinkled around it. But it was basically heaped with tons of like onions that weren't on the menu. Stuff that I couldn't identify that was maybe eggplant, which is a no-no for me because it's a pet peeve. (laughs) Um, And then the sausage was neither spicy nor fennel flavored. And it was basically strewn all over this heap of whatever substance was was already on it. So it was a case of something that if it had been served as advertised, it would have been great. But it was overly complicated and frankly ruined for me. The only time you can eat something which you can't identify is when you're in a fancy exactly. place. Because you're like, I don't know what right. this stuff's called, yep. but it looks good. When you're eating regular food, you should be able to tell good where point. everything is. All right, so you can overcomplicate pizza. I've got one from the internet. Another unpopular opinion. When you're in a relationship, you can keep secrets. <laughs> Who came up with this one? Can you? Are we keeping secrets, folks? Notice how no one is saying anything. No comments. I hope everyone's partner is listening to this (laughs) episode. Because if you are, it's about to get rocky. No one? No one wants to jump in on this one? My wife is sitting immediately in the other room, so I'm just going to pretend that... (laughs) Talk about your friend. Talk about your friend and what they would do. You shouldn't want to keep secrets from your partner. I feel like that is just... Not a great place to start for a strong foundation for a relationship. Um, If you have to like try and think about everything you say before you say it, just so you don't like let something slip accidentally, that's a slippery slope. So, Mm -hmm. but I also, you know, I don't know other people's lives. (laughs) Evelyn, if I've in some way, shape or form by asking or proposing this unpopular opinion have ruined your future marriage, (laughs) (laughs) I sincerely apologize. I mean, you can keep secrets, but you probably shouldn't. Is that you got to keep a couple, haven't you? There's, you don't tell them I everything. Mean, yeah, keep keep secrets about like what gifts yeah. you buy. Yeah. Sure, like you know, Ooh, there's a line. I nice, think. very nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you can. We got one from panel, and Paul has got one for us about uh, bringing your whole self to work. Paul, what's your yeah? Unpopular so you opinion? know, I hear a lot of talk about this idea of bringing your whole self to work, and I understand and agree with the sentiment behind it, but I do have to take exception to it. I love what I do and I often hardly even think of it as work. And I'm very lucky that my personal interests and my work are fairly well aligned. But if I were to really bring my whole self to work, I would be doing things that are not really accepted in a work environment, like imitating accents, which I love to do. And I never do it disparagingly, (laughs) but that's the way it can be interpreted. Um, You know, people can easily take offense. Mm. I'm also someone whose first language is not English. So I don't get to practice my native language or my native culture in a work setting. And Mm. I'm someone who occasionally likes to turn off my camera during video meetings. So apparently that puts me at a disadvantage. So I'm actually being penalized for bringing my whole self to work. So, you know, kudos to anyone who truly feels they can bring their entire authentic selves to work. But personally, I feel like I'm good settling with about 70 percent. I suspect I'm not alone in that. So you're saying don't be yourself. I'm saying be yourself (laughs) to the extent that you can, but the idea of like your whole self and to be the exact same person you are when you're out with friends and in the office, I just don't think that really happens with a lot of people. So I thought bringing your whole self to work was like, be here, be present, be focused. But you're interpreting it as... People saying, be yourself, right. do it, but you can't That's be That's the way I interpret it. Maybe I've been completely misinterpreting that the whole time, in which case we can just rewind and erase this whole thing. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's how I interpret it, Paul. I completely agree with you because there has been this movement of sort of bringing your whole self to work. And I think that has a lot to do with sort of like overcoming biases in the workplace. You know, what is a professional way to look in terms of like how people prefer to wear their hair and what they dress and how they communicate. But I do think that, you know, there is a social code that requires people to bring a certain degree of professionalism to work in order to maintain like an equilibrium of communication and compromise and things like that. Whereas nobody's really expected to go home and act in that, you know, quote unquote, professional way. But I think the fact that you you shouldn't feel uncomfortable being, you know, who you are at work, I think that's one thing. But then also bringing an attitude that is maybe 
a little bit more open to sort of following the greater good of what you're trying to achieve as like a group of people in a professional setting is sort of like the other side of it that is also important. All right, so I'm I'm hearing bring some of yourself, not the baggage. <laughs> Just the good parts. Yeah, bring, bring the, the good, good parts. Bits. Yeah. <laughs> bring the good bits. All right. Evelyn, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes if you bring your entire whole self to work, it can get hard to draw boundaries, like healthy boundaries around who you are as a person outside of your work. And that's something that I think is harder to do when you love your job a lot, because loving your job has a lot to do with who you are and where you work also. (laughs) But I also, Paul, to your point, I love this job. It's so much fun. And sometimes it can be hard to pull myself away from the work. But I think remembering that there are parts of me that exist outside of work is important and it helps me remember okay I have you know I have a dog I have to take her on a walk I have a family to pay attention to and and there are other parts of my life that are not work and it, it is important to keep yeah. your eye on those at all times and, even when you're at work which and is for a separate you, Evelyn, thing I mean <laughs> and and you know if I may reveal something about you Evelyn in this public forum you are a lover of potatoes in an avocado centric office. So that right there is a conflict. So, you know, we'll have to we'll have to work on a that. Lover one, of, yes. of potatoes? I'll let Evelyn explain, explain it. Explain that for us, please. <laughs> I love potatoes. I okay, can't thanks. eat <laughs> thanks for clearing that up. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I can't eat gluten. Um, and so my attachment, attachment to potatoes has grown significantly okay. in the last few years as a result of that, because Sometimes you just need a heavy, starchy thing, and potatoes really serve that need. And they're so versatile. I could talk about <laughs> potatoes forever. I don't know so if we want to go into up. this. What do you have a favorite? <laughs> let's, let's, do you have a favorite potato? We'll end there. Um, I love a good, crispy roasted potato that's oh. like really nice and crispy on the outside yeah. and fluffy on the inside. Oh. Nice. Yeah. With a good roast, with a good English roast dinner. Maybe leave out the uh, English part. Sun- sure. <laughs> Sunday roast. No one? No one? I, okay. I'll say... Or a mash, a good mash. Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say that, you know, what, when everybody who joins our company is asked to put together a slide, like an about me slide, and they list their likes and dislikes. Mm. And when Evelyn did hers, <laughs> among the likes were potatoes and something like aesthetically pleasing decks. And I thought, okay, that's cool. You know, like she likes a backyard, you know, and I could almost envision like... <laughs> <laughs> this plate of perfectly roasted on the outside, but fluffy potatoes on the inside, sitting on a table on this beautiful deck. She actually meant slide decks, <laughs> which I thought was really funny. And on the About Me slides um, of Evelyn, there wasn't a photo. It was just a picture of Mrs. Potato Head. <laughs> oh. Okay, fair enough. That's all we've got time for, for uncommon knowledge. It's time now for dinner party data. This is the part of the show where we tell you about the most interesting thing that we've recently learned. We start with Blake because he won the game of the week. Blake, what have you learned? This is a poll from YouGov America uh, that asked, how trustworthy do you rate the news reported by the following broadcast, print, or digital media organizations? Does anyone want to guess what the number one answer is? Behind the numbers. No, no, um, no. I mean the most trusted media outlet? Wrong answer. Yeah, the most trustworthy media organization. That's a loaded one. Wasn't, you sure it wasn't behind the... Um, yeah, no, it's not behind the numbers. BBC. You have a second guess. BBC? BBC? Very close, very close. Uh, The AP? PBS? Nope. New York Times? Reuters? Nope, nope, nope. All right, the Weather Channel. Oh, so, they haven't got right. a clue what's going on. I wasn't the Weather of them Channel news, is wrong frankly. more than any other news organization. <laughs> but they out own there. it. Trusted, <laughs> but they can be wrong yeah. all the time. They're constantly they wrong. wrong the they were wrong yesterday. The they don't know that. when it's going to rain. The they don't that. know what the temperature is going to be, and yet people still think they're the most trustworthy. It's just, you know, it's baffling. I would love to be an analyst at the Weather Channel. Not too late, Blake. To be wrong constantly. <laughs> and people uh, would still trust me. Number one? What was number two? Number number two is the BBC. Oh, my God. They beat the... And then number Live three it. is... Number three was PBS. Behind the numbers. Oh, okay, PBS. Right. So, obviously, people do trust publicly 
funded news stations, mm. uh, whether or not one might be more, you know, publicly funded, like PBS, or one might be, you know, run by the world's most, the world's longest monarchy, uh, the BBC, uh, and Lagos, may have some, bi- Lagos, some potential uh, biases to the crown. Biases uh, to the, the Queen's uh, not telling <laughs> the news people what to say. What do you you think don't going know on? that she's not. What the, what is happening right now? I'm, I'm just I'm saying I'm that, that the she's not, I know one. she's got other things to worry about. I'm pretty certain. <laughs> Unbelievable. The Queen is behind the, be- oh, <laughs> look, okay, Blake. Once, if you control the medium, control the message. <laughs> Like has lost his mind on this episode. All right, uh, moving on. Evelyn, what have you got for us? Okay, so it's been mentioned a few times today. Um, I am engaged. I am planning my wedding, which most of the time is very fun and exciting. And a lot of the time is also very stressful for a lot of different reasons. One of them being differing perspectives on wedding traditions. So I have some data here that I definitely looked up on my own time because I was curious um, and I wanted to have some some data to back up conversations I'm having with family members about my own wedding. This is from YouGov, a survey <laughs> taken in, in June of 2021. Such an analyst. That, I know, classic. Um, my, my parents were not surprised to hear me bring some stats to the, to the table. But these are about wedding traditions that Americans think should be dropped or preserved that are you know, old school. There are a few that by and large, most people agree should be preserved. Things like um, the bride and groom exchanging rings, the bride and groom having a first dance, sending thank you notes to guests. Uh, by and large, people yeah. agree those should be preserved. And then the more contentious ones, I'll go straight for the money here, Let's is the, the top wedding tradition that Americans think should be dropped is the bride promising to obey her husband. Um, I didn't even know that was a thing. What's what's happening in America? Yeah. Uh, Brides promising to obey their husbands. It's... uh, (laughs) I've been to a bunch of weddings. I didn't expect this to be so surprising. in America. I have never heard that happen. What is happening? Well, maybe it wasn't surprising to me because I grew up in the South and it's pretty... Okay. A lot of of things are old school down there. Let's get that um, out of there. All right. What else we got? Well, I was going to say, YouGov also went in a little bit deeper on these trends and they broke things out by gender and age, but the bride promising to obey her husband, they broke things out by men and women and women, 61% of women survey respondents agreed that the bride promising to obey her husband should be dropped as a tradition, but only 38% of men agreed that it should be dropped. How is it not 100%? 60 and... What's happening right yeah, now? Yeah, both of those numbers are alarming. Yeah. They seem low. I they know. seem <laughs> like they should be 100. Okay, is this something that the uh, the reverend person says? And they go, yes, yes, I'll do that. Is that where this pops yeah, up? It's, yeah, it's part of the ceremony, uh, uh, typically, I probably, I might have tuned is. out when they're saying all this. They say a lot of stuff. They do. They can be yeah. a lot. Marcus is usually tearing up a lot at that point um, yeah, because weddings make him very emotional. Yeah. So, My brother got married in India. That was five, that was five days of wedding. Oh, that was definitely too much. Sorry, Matthew, but that was, I'm just kidding. It was a great time. <laughs> kidding. He doesn't listen to the show, so it's fine. All right. What was the second worst? Well, the second thing that people wanted. Um, uh, the scraps. second most popular tradition that respondents thought should be dropped is the bride's family paying for the wedding. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which again had, had uh, fewer men agreeing that it should be dropped than women. Seems like a lot to just be like, you, you take care of it. <laughs> You could just take care of that for us. That'd be great. Because as a lady, just take care of that for us. Um, all right. Fair enough. Very good. Paul. You're yes. Up. In honor of Earth Day and not my birthday, which was this past Tuesday, here's a fun fact about our planet. Paul. Wow. Paul. Happy birthday, Paul. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. But we digress. Paul. So here's a fun fact about our planet. If you were to ask 20 people what the highest peak on Earth is, I'm sure at least 19 would say Mount Everest, and the other one might simply not know. And if you did say Mount Everest, you would be correct, but only if you measure the peaks relative to their height above sea level. Now, in the interest of always examining and questioning research methodology, an equally valid way to measure peaks is by their distance from the center of the Earth. By that metric, the highest peak is one you probably have never heard of, an inactive volcano in Ecuador called 
Chimborazo. And that's because the equatorial bulge that makes the Earth more of an oval shape than a sphere means that Chimborazo in Ecuador is more than two kilometers further from the center of the Earth than Mount Everest is. So there you have it. A new way to look mm. at the highest mountain wow. on Earth. Wow. Very nice. Very nice I will indeed. be climbing <laughs> neither of those. Yep, me neither. I was going to say, what drives people to do that? That's it's too high. Great. Agreed. I'm just exhausted if I go on a walk around the block. Up a mountain? Yeah, and people who no. say because it's there, I'm like, yeah, we know it's there. It's always been there. There's lots that of stuff that's It there. doesn't yeah. excuse it. No, I need to walk over everything. All right, I've got one for you. Did I cover everybody? I feel like I've been skipping most people the whole episode. Okay, cool. All right, I've got one for you real quick. Why does every American town appear to have a water tower? Okay, does you, are you guys baffled by this? Maybe it's just because I'm not from here and I've been driving around the country a bunch. But... Uh, every town has its own water tower. Is that just something you just like? I've noticed thing? it. I, I've never, just never really it. thought about it. Maybe it's because we haven't okay. had a, a, a monarch telling us not to do that. <laughs> oh my goodness! Who are you talking about? That person who's in charge of the BBC. <laughs> oh, cry out loud! Uh, all right. So I did a bunch of research because I drove a long distance recently across America, and uh, yeah. So basically, they hold excess water. The main use of water towers is to provide water during high peak periods, generally in the morning for coffees, sinks, toilets, showers, things like that. And then during low use periods, water is pumped back into the towers from the town's water supply to refill uh, the water towers. Um, so basically like a lot of the water that you get just goes straight to the taps and if there's any excess and you back up, that will go into the water tower. They can provide water in case of a power outage since they work via gravity, because it's all pumped upwards. Um, so if there's power outage, they don't need pumps to move the water through the pipes, so they can be helpful in an emergency. A normal in-ground swimming pool in someone's backyard might hold something like 20,000 to 30,000 gallons of water. A typical water tower might hold 50 times that amount, 50 times the amount that you find in a swimming pool. A water tower's tank is sized to hold about a day's worth of water for the community served by the tower, if the pumps fail, for example, during a power failure, the water tower holds enough water to keep things flowing for about a day. There are about 15,000 water towers in the US. Coolest looking one, in my opinion, is one in Lexington, Kentucky, shaped like a Dixie cup. Hmm. Which is just cool. So that's yeah. water towers. Learn Sweet. something new every day. I'm fascinated yep. by them. I think I they're no the coolest. Idea. Water towers are how I knew where I was growing up in, in Georgia. <laughs> Oh yeah, they have water tower. They're labeled with the county. Yeah. Uh huh. And they yeah. irrigate the potato yeah. fields. So they are. <laughs> <laughs> they don't really have those in Georgia. <laughs> but they do have water towers in places that, where potatoes grow. Mm, that is true. That How is do you the, get your? Oh, what's your yeah. water supply like in in the UK? What do you do if the water fails there? Uh, it doesn't fail. You just <laughs> oh snap! Mic drop. <laughs> That's all we've got time for for today's episode. Thank you to my guests. It fails often. I'm kidding. It what you fails. do in the UK is you just wait for rain. So you wait five minutes and you get a <laughs> whole water supply. We got plenty of water. Yeah, good point. <laughs> Touche. Good point. Uh, thank you to my guests. Thank you to Evelyn. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you to Paul. Thank you. Thank you to Blake, this week's winner of the game of the week. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you to Todd, who is editing the show for us. Thanks to everyone listening. To ask questions or just say hi, you can email us at podcast at emarketer.com. We'll see you guys on Monday for the Behind the Numbers Daily, the Emarketer podcast made possible by M Particle. Happy weekends. <laughs> <laughs>